on my mission to decide which hardware wallet is the best for security researchers, I had to go out and try four more hardware wallets that came highly recommended from a lot of people in the industry. Now, will any of these save Ethereum and the signing crisis that we're facing right now? People be signing shit like what happened in the Bybit hack or in the Radiant Capital hack because they don't really know what they're signing. So will one of these wallets solve that problem or is it back to the drawing board? After my last review, I had a number of wallets in my DM saying things like, hey dude, showing the call data was annoying to our users, so we just stopped doing it. The hardest part of selling the car was to get people to sign the paperwork. So we just started blindfolding them. And I know I'm gonna get flack from a whole bunch of wallets that I review in this video as well, but I take the flack from these wallets and I do it for you all so that you can make better informed decisions about what hardware wallets you want. And then hopefully I open up a dialogue with these hardware wallets and they make improvements. And as always, I'm reviewing these wallets as a security researcher and somebody who works with smart contracts and DeFi all the time. And I wanna see transparency and I wanna see security and I wanna see how easy can I get wrecked in my day-to-day -day life using this wallet? So let's find out if any of these save Ethereum, starting with the safe pal. Also, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. And before we even get into anything, they have an SFP token. So you know that unless I say this is the best wallet ever, all the token holders are gonna flood to my comments and tell me how biased I was for this. Yay, doing independent reviews is so rewarding. Now, the first thing to point out is that nothing that the SafePal team has built has passed the wallet scrutiny tests, meaning this wallet is not open source. Now, granted, I have the SafePal Pro, so technically it hasn't been tested by the wallet scrutiny team, but I digress. However, a quick side note, after speaking with a lot of the different teams, the open source criteria might not be as binary as is or isn't. Most chips are not open source intentionally, which is still spooky to me. However, in future videos, I actually might focus on what is open sourced and if everything other than the chip is open sourced, but I digress. Now, jumping into using the wallet, there were a lot of things that I thought were really cool. Like for example, it came with both its own browser extension and a mobile wallet, app, which felt nice when using the wallet. It felt like I was in one cohesive ecosystem. The back of the wallet also had a camera to scan QR codes, which I also really like as well, because that, in my opinion, is one of the best ways to transfer data back and forth between different devices. It can be air-gapped, has an EAL 6 plus rating. It's not that expensive. However, I want to know how well this wallet holds up for me, someone who uses DeFi and EVM and smart contracts. And this is where the wallet, in my opinion, loses basically all its points. Of course, to test these wallets, I connected to a safe wallet interface and tried to send a couple of different DeFi transactions, such as sending an ERC-20 token or doing some batched DeFi Aave borrow loaning stuff. And while the SafePal browser extension actually worked quite nicely, it was the following steps that were really frustrating. So first of all, when you go to sign an EIP-712 message, it prompts you to actually connect to your mobile app. Okay, so you send your browser extension transaction to your mobile app, which will then show you a QR code, which you will then need to scan with your hardware wallet. So to do anything with this hardware wallet, you need three wallets, kind of a bizarre design choice, but let's see what you can actually verify on the device. Uh, almost nothing. When going to sign an EIP-712 transaction, which is needed for any type of multi-sig, the browser extension shows you everything you need to see, which is great. The mobile wallet shows you pretty much everything you need to see, which is great. But then the actual hardware wallet, the thing that I actually want me to show me everything I want to see, truncates it. So I can't really trust the hardware wallet because it doesn't even show me what I need to see. So then I have to trust either the mobile wallet or the browser extension. But if I verify one and not the other, and only one is hacked, then that's really bad. Then I really need to verify both. But now I'm doing double the verification work and I'm still not trusting the hardware wallet. Uh, I don't love this. So as you know, okay, no problem. Let's try to send at least a transaction. Let's see what shows up there. And unsurprisingly, we get pretty much the same experience. So the transaction goes from the browser extension to the mobile app, which gives you a QR code, which you have to scan, verify on your device, send back to your mobile application, which you have to scan. That's a QR code on your safe pal that now your phone needs to scan, which will then send the transaction back over to the browser wallet, which will then execute it. All the while, uh, the call data is truncated on the actual hardware device. Anyways, the thing that I actually trust 
not all this random software that can very easily get hacked. So for me, I give this wallet two stars out of 10. You can't see the EAP 712 data. You can't see the call data. You have to rely on software in order to interact with this wallet. And those software applications don't even decode the call data or make it easier to read anyways. And then additionally, it's not open sourced. So would I recommend this to Bybit Ben? Absolutely not. Would I recommend this to a security researcher? Also absolutely not. Token holders, sorry. Moving on to the Bitbox O2, multi-edition. The reason I ended up reviewing the Bitbox O2 is because they reached out to me on Twitter and said to review them. Now, I've done this a couple times before, and most of the time, severely disappointed. However, with the Bitbox O2, I actually was pretty pleasantly surprised. Now, the Bitbox O2 doesn't have an EAL rating, and this is because of a unique architecture that they use. Their firmware is actually totally open source, which is verified by the wallet scrutiny team, which also gets a huge thumbs up from me. But they take a different approach where they want the firmware to be able to be completely open source and then have a secure chip as well that is closed source, but you don't have to trust the secure chip to make mistakes. The reason we get so nervous about closed source is because that closed source code could be doing anything and we have no way to verify it's doing what it, they say that they're doing. But yet secure chips are incredibly important to block physical attacks, such as somebody trying to break into the hardware wall itself and extract the private key like that. So you want to use secure chips to prevent physical attacks, but most secure chips are closed source due to non-disclosure agreements with the manufacturers that actually make them. All the manufacturers want to keep their secret sauce secret. So we don't want to trust closed source software, but we do want to use secure chips. How do you do both? So reading about Bitbox's implementation of having a closed source chip that you don't need to trust while also running everything else on open source firmware was pretty cool. Huge kudos to their team for doing this. It comes in both a Bitcoin only and a multi-edition, which of course I use the multi-edition because we're using smart contracts. And also comes with this really tiny little micro SD chip, which is a nice backup of the wallet itself, which I found to be very useful because disaster recovery is something that not a lot of wallets do a great job of helping you out with. When you get the wallet set up, there's some software that you can install to verify the correctness of the firmware, which is great as well. Now it took me a little bit to get used to interacting with the wallet. It has these like touch sensors. If you just tap a part of the wallet, it counts as pressing a button. The device itself is really small and doesn't have a whole lot of real estate. So whenever I see one of these smaller wallets, I get a little bit nervous because these are typically really tough to read data off of them. Speaking of which, let's try to send a safe transaction. To work with Bitbox on the safe wallet site or any DeFi site, you could either use their direct software or you first have to get set up with their Bitbox app, which comes with a wallet connect built in. I really like using browser extensions, so I went ahead and I installed this thing called the Bitbox Bridge, which I needed to run in order to connect the Bitbox directly into a Ravi. And then once I ran that, I was able to import the hardware wallet into my Ravi like normal. It looks like MetaMask doesn't have this functionality yet, but with Ravi, it seemed to work really well. Once connected to Ravi to sign an EIP 712 message, you just sign like you normally would in Rabbi, and then it'll send the message directly to your Bitbox. I will say typing your password in into this thing every day was a huge pain in the butt, but whatever. Obviously, you can see the EIP 712 data in Rabbi, And here is where Bitbox sets a phenomenal example for the rest of the wallets. Look at this real estate. There's almost no screen real estate on this thing. And yet this wallet is able to display every single piece of information on the EAP 712 struct. Other wallets do better. It was kind of funky tapping the sides and scrolling and figuring out how to do that, but it actually showed all the data for the EIP 712 message that I signed, and that was fantastic. That's, that's all I want. That's all I want. I just want to see the data. Pleasantly, sending a transaction was the exact same experience. You connect through Rabi, you send the transaction, the transaction call data shows up on your wallet for you to verify, and you can go ahead and press the two sides and send it. You don't have to trust any other device. It's all right on your hardware device. Obviously, extracting the data off the hardware device is basically impossible, which kind of sucks. You do have to rely on your eyes to make sure that the call data is correct. But if you want to spot check some characters, you can do that. Ideally, there would be some way for me to get the data off, maybe with a QR code or something like that. But this wallet has pretty much everything I would want in a wallet. It's open source. It shows me the data on the wallet for both signing messages and sending transactions. I don't know enough about EAL ratings to really comment on how good their chip is. But from what I can see, this is a very solid wallet. Remember with me, anything above a five is like good. And this wallet gets a six stars out of 10 for me. Would I recommend this to Bybit Ben? Probably not because the data is in its raw format. But would I recommend this to a security researcher? Yeah, absolutely. It's open source. You can view everything you need to view. Hell yeah.
All right, next, the burner wallet. I don't know how much my green screen is gonna screw with showing this wallet. So I'm gonna save you all some time on this one. As a wallet with no screen and is just a chip slash card, as a security researcher who wants to verify all his data, obviously there's no way to do that. In my last video, I gave a lot of crap to Tangem because Tangem was also a card wallet. UseBurner is also a card wallet, and for both of them, there's no way to verify call data. But I think that I was judging a fish by its ability to climb a tree. What I mean by that is I think I should judge these card wallets differently than I judge hardware wallets. In my opinion, these types of wallets, these card wallets should be exactly kind of like wallets. You load 20 bucks on them, you walk around, you go buy a drink with them, whatever. Because you can't verify the call data on them, would I ever recommend you put any large amounts of money on this? No, but like to pay for a coffee or something, you know, sure, whatever. Now, I did think that this card could be very convenient. It was a tap to pay card. You tap your phone to the card and boom, like that's how you send transactions. I will say, though, to use this wallet was a, a bit cumbersome for me. You first have to spin up a Halo gateway on your phone, which I guess is kind of like running a server on your phone. And you would connect this to the burner OS on your desktop which would interact with your phone, which you would then use your, the RFID chip in the card to tap your phone to send transactions. Even on the UI, you couldn't check call data. But then again, you know, who cares? Because you're just tapping your card, you're already screwed. If the website is hacked, you're extra screwed. So like, whatever, I need, I guess I just need to relax. I can see these types of wallets being really popular in the future, kind of similar to like walking around with cash. The website says burners make great gift cards. They're 20 bucks. So I don't know, I would rather just send some money directly. I can't use it to walk into a grocery store and tap to pay with crypto. Basically, I'm hoping that one day these type of cards are very popular and you can use them basically as cash. I think that will be nice. But even given this, I thought this was pretty clunky and hard to work with. I don't I don't think it's quite there yet. I think some small improvements would be obviously to show the call data on the OS. I would love to see some type of open source app to go with this as well. And maybe even change some of the marketing. I don't think these make good gift cards. Maybe that's just me. And then finally, we have the Engrave wallet. Now, I was really excited for this wallet. This wallet feels good. It feels good in your hand. It looks good. It's got biometrics for your finger. It's got a camera for QR codes, which is awesome. It's compatible with MetaMask with these QR codes, which I love to see. Going through the website, you can see it's one of the few wallets that's EAL7 verified. Everybody else is six or five. EAL7 means their secure element is formally verified, which is really exciting. They market themselves as the coldest crypto wallet, which I love to hear. I want a secure cold wallet. This is really exciting to me. The user interface is really easy to use, super, super seamless custom operating system. It doesn't pass the wallet scrutiny open source test, but as we said, because they have the secure chip, it's not the end of the world. And then I sent some transactions. First off, it doesn't matter if you're signing an EFP 712 message, a regular message or sending a transaction on the wallet, it always just says signing a transaction. And when it goes to show you the data of what you're signing, this is what it shows you. I don't know if you know what this is, but this definitely isn't an EIP 712 struct and it's not even hex. I ran into a similar issue with the Ledger Nano X where it showed some very bizarre format of the data and I had to figure out for some users how to actually convert the weird binary that the Ledger Nano X give me to what it actually should be in hex. But for this, I didn't even bother. I have no idea what it's showing me and I cannot verify the struct. Most other hardware wallets at least show you the struct. I don't know how or why they're encoding the data in this not used anywhere else format. So this was just for signing the messages and this is what most other hardware wallets get right. So this kind of scared me. But in any case, I proceeded to send a transaction with this wallet. And once again, I got this incredibly bizarre formatted data. It says, hey, verify your call data. Here's your call data. What the hell is this? Which is too bad because everything else about this wallet is really good. I love the camera on it. I love the scanning of the QR codes. I love the biometrics. It feels good. Like I said, the user interface is beautiful. It's EAL7 rating. Again, I'm not an EAL rating expert, but that sounds like pretty freaking good. But then the thing that actually matters, it just falls so, so short on. It, it made me really sad. So the Engrave Zero, not open sourced, can't see the EIP 712 data, can't see the call data. It definitely doesn't decode the call data. It does have a fantastically secure element though, 
which is great. This wallet could be one of my favorite wallets if it fixes this call data issue. And while you're working on it, Engrave, you might as well decode the call data as well. But at the moment, I cannot recommend this to Bybit Ben. There is nothing for Bybit Ben to verify on the wallet. And I definitely can't recommend this to a security researcher. Two out of 10 stars. However, this wallet could be phenomenal if they fixed some of these call data issues because, like I said, it already has QR code support. So getting data into the wallet is really easy. Getting data off of the wallet, I would expect to be really easy with them showing QR codes. This wallet could be my favorite in the future. But as of right now, two out of 10 stars. The Bitbox. O2 multi edition as of today enters the echelon of what I consider acceptable wallets to use in the EVM ecosystem. Thanks all. Please remember to like and subscribe because I put out new videos every time I feel like it.